This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Example number three. Dora House has employment income of £60,000 in 22-23. Rental income received of £10,000. She paid maintenance expenditure on that property of £800 and has mortgage interest charges of £6,000. So if we have a look at the answer to that, we'll see how all those various bits that we've talked about all come together. First things first, and this is where we talked in chapter two about doing workings first and then the answer, or the answer and then um, workings first. So this top part here is the working. So in this example, the workings have been done first, and then this underneath here this is the answer it doesn't matter whether you do the workings first and the answers second as long as you clearly show the examiner what you're doing so this is a working clearly shown so from the question we see that she had ten thousand pounds rental income and maintenance costs of 800 so her property income nine thousand two hundred pounds that is then put into her income tax computation. So if you were doing this as a, as a full answer, you would put her name. So Dora House, income tax computation, 2223, etc, etc. Her employment income, we've copied from the question. And property income and employment income are both non-savings income. So you'd only need one column for this. Chapter two explains that there are four column approach. Um, hopefully you've watched that recording and, and lecture before you've come to this and this makes sense. If it doesn't and you haven't, go back and watch the previous chapter to make sure that you understand how this is working. I would advise that you watch these lectures in the order in which they are in the manual. So employment income and the property income gives a total income of 69,200. This is the personal allowance that is in the rates at the front of the exam. Uh, and I explain that in the introductory lecture. Always check because it changes. So this is the Finance Act 22 personal allowance, giving a taxable income of 56,000. At 300. The non savings income, this is the basic rate. Again, that amount is in the rates. Make sure you check that and always double do your maths. Um, the balance of the income is then taxed at high rate, which is 40%. Now, one of the expenses in the question was the mortgage interest charge of £6,000. And as we've discussed, that is a tax deduction at basic rate, 20%, giving relief of £1,200. And a tax liability of £13,912. Moving on to furnished holiday lettings. Now these are special rules because it's treated as a trade. So you can actually have capital allowances. The income qualifies as earnings for pension relief, which we will see later. And you get the capital gains tax reliefs Again, we will see those later in the, um, in the course. It's always worked out on a cash basis. And the losses are carried forward against future profits from this holiday letting only. They stick together. Now, this is a very favourable type of... Um, property income. 
So there are various conditions. These are the rules. You need to learn them. I have seen this as a multiple choice question. You'll probably find one in the Kaplan, not the Kaplan, the BPP um, revision guide. So it's got to be available to let for at least 210 days. Again, days, not months. Actually let for 105 of those and no one person occupies for more than 31 consecutive days. Otherwise, it's not a holiday letting. Um, I doubt people go for five six weeks in the same property. So those are the conditions. And those are the benefits at the top. So the benefits at the top conditions further down. Um, as I say, I have seen um, that as a multiple choice uh, question. Now, rent a room relief. Individual lets a room furnished in his or her main residence as living accommodation. So the first seven and a half thousand pounds of income is exempt from tax. That's what your rent a room um, really um, um, gives you. Now, if the rents exceed that amount, there are two ways in which the excess income can be taxed. Okay, firstly, the, what's known as the ordinary calculation, which is the gross rent less expenses, which is the property income, which is the normal one, which is what we've been doing so far. Income less outgoings. Alternatively, and it is an election, you can go for the gross rent less rent a room relief and then you can choose which one uh, you want once you've done the election it stays there until you change your mind let's have a look at example um, number four example number four barbara rents out her room in her main residence gross rents are six and a half six hundred and fifty pounds a month annual expenses amount to twelve hundred pounds so six fifty a month times twelve months equals seven thousand eight hundred pounds so if we do the normal calculation we'll just take the expenses off okay which would then give us what six thousand six hundred pounds so that's the normal one. However, if we chose this one, that would be £7,800 Oops, times 7 minus £7,500 is only £300. Which one would you rather pay tax on? I'm sure you'd agree. You'd rather pay tax on that one. Uh, that's the one you would choose. That's the election that you would submit. And that £300 then goes in your income tax computation. Rent a room relief is unlikely to come up in the bigger questions, very much more a multiple choice question, where it would be like example number four, where you've got this um, rent a room um, with an income, you've got to work out what the rental is, do the two calculations and decide which one um, you prefer. Now, right at the very beginning of this chapter, um, I discussed the fact that we you get your income from property from two places. One would be rent, which we've been discussing. When is the income arising? Um, in advance, uh, in arrears, cash basis, accruals basis, what can you have as expenses? What happens to the finance? All of those things, we've dealt with all of that. I then mentioned that the second source of income could be a lease premium on the grant of a short lease. Short lease, 50 years or less. So, when a tenant takes on a new lease, he may be required to pay a one-off premium in addition to rent. If the lease is less than 50 years, part of it is assessed on the landlord. Okay, now, 
The amount that is assessed as property income on the landlord is not what he receives. OK, so it's not what is received. OK, this formula. Now you have to remember this. Is um, what is needed. So just a quick explanation of how the situation works. So we maybe got a landlord who grants a tenant um, a lease of say 20 years. Okay and in return the tenant pays a premium of £10,000. So the landlord has received £10,000. He doesn't pay tax on that £10,000. That £10,000 is not the figure that is included in his income tax computation. It is this figure, 10000 which is the total premium, times 51 from the uh, minus 20 over 50. And that's how you would work out the figure. All right, that's how you would work out the figure. Now, that's one method. So you can do it either that way, if you can remember that one, or there is an alternative way of doing it. Alternatively, the assessable premium may be computed as the full premium, which is the £10,000 in this case, less 2% of the premium for the number of years of the lease less one again that is what you have to remember you choose which one both of them are acceptable in the exam as long as you clearly show what you've done you would need to put you would need to write that out and then do the numbers so you've shown that you know the rule and you have applied the rule. Alternatively, if you choose to do this one, this is the rule, write it out like that, and then apply the rule and put in the numbers. Whichever, it doesn't really matter, whichever one you feel um, you're better able to, um, to remember. Okay, this is what's key, is you've got to be able um, to remember it. So let's have a look at an example. Bill grants Richard a lease. So Bill is the landlord. Richard is the tenant. Okay. So it's a 20 year lease with a premium of £6,000 on it. How does this are going to work then? Because we've got rental income in there as well. So what we need to do is to work out his property income assessment for the year. So first things first, he received rent of £5,000. Then he received a premium. So that is therefore the property income assessment. And this would then be a little working. We'll use the first method. 51 times minus 20 divided by 50 times 60,000 is 37,200. Now, I've written that out clearly. What I need you to do is to pause the uh, recording at this point. Check that you agree with that number. See how it's been done. 51 minus 20 divided by 50. And then you multiply that by £60,000. And you should come to 37200 So give it a pause. Check you've done it. Start the recording again. 37200 42,200 is his property income. Now, 
in the situations that we've been dealing with, we've looked at the landlord. And now we need to look at the tenant. So we've looked at the landlord. He only pays tax on the proportion of that premium according to whichever calculation that you want to do. Now, the tenant's paid that fee. He's paid that money up front. So that's an expense in his eyes. It's a massive expense. And it would probably result in a loss for that um, tenant. Therefore, uh, he wouldn't pay any tax. He would have to wait for that loss to be relieved the following year. So we have a rule, another rule, that stops this. So the expense that the tenant can claim is the same figure as the landlord is paying tax on, but it's divided out and spread out over the number of years of the lease. So let me just reiterate that with the notes. Where a trader pays a premium, he may deduct the following and your amount against his profits in each of the years of the lease. So it's spread out over the lease where it's used for trade. OK, so what we're going to do is look at example number four above and show the relief available to Richard for the premium that he paid. So Richard is the tenant. Bill is the landlord. Now, the premium that the landlord, so the landlord we worked out will have to include 37,200 in his income tax computation because that's the amount of the premium that he's got to pay tax on. Now, the tenant can spread that expense over 20 years. So it's a spreading device. And he can claim £1,860 per annum or every year in his account. So the landlord only pays tax on a proportion of the premium using those two methods. You may have to stop this, go back, read it again. Not the easiest thing in the world, but once it's clicked, there's a lot of marks to be gotten for this because it some students find it a little bit hard. So watch it to the end, stop it, go back, watch it again. That's what's important. Make sure you get it fixed firmly um, in your head. Part of this chapter also includes investments. We have two here that you need to be aware of. ISAs, individual savings accounts. Uh, they're very efficient. They're free of income tax. The shares, if you put shares in, they're free from capital gains tax. You can make a withdrawal at any time. Okay, you can make a withdrawal at any time. You are unlikely to come across them in a big computation. This is definitely multiple choice question area, section A of your exam. There are two types, a cash one or a stocks and shares one. And again, that's income tax free. That's CGT free. You can put in up to 20,000 a year. And again, this limit is in the rates. Check it, never guess. Examiner's given you that information, use it might get you some marks in your exam and multi-choice question. National savings certificates. Now you remember the certificates are exempt. Remember they sometimes can pop up in income tax computations. We looked at that previously in chapter two. Now there are also investment accounts and easy access accounts. Okay, income is received gross and they are risk free. So that's the end of this chapter. You can now go practice these questions and I'll see you in the next chapter.